So I'm very pleased to introduce Inez Fung, a very distinguished atmospheric scientist and professor at, at UC Berkeley. Uh, Inez studies uh, GFD, large-scale modeling, um, biogeochemical cycles, um, remote sensing, atmosphere, biosphere interactions. And um, Inez wanted to me to say that she was the second female graduate student of the meteorology program the here. And number one, sis. And the number one, sis. And Eugenia is uh, the, the first. Over to you, Inez. Thank you. Thank you. When John Marshall invited me here and gave me the date, I have to say I was very nervous because I remembered um, Professor Lorenz's seminar on predictability was rescheduled three times because of snowstorms. And I got more nervous uh, this January. I don't need to remind you folks here about the superstorm. Uh, that was, it was super cold, super uh, everything, and all sorts of names have been given. But when you look at not, not the total temperature, but the departure, temperature departure from the, from the long-term mean, what you see is that the East Coast is fairly isolated, that on a particular day, Alaska was 55 degrees Fahrenheit, while Miami was 30-some degrees, My, Alaska was warmer, um, and this is very clearly a sign of climate change. And at the bottom, you see the world that day was, half, was 0.6 Celsius warmer than normal. And when we go to the snowstorm, then the sea surface temperature that day was also, the Atlantic was much warmer than normal. And so given Clausius Klepperon, there was more moisture and there was, a, there was a storm and the nor'easterly brought more snow, um, et cetera. So, this is obviously, uh, I wouldn't say I'll, I'll let other people talk about the probability, how much of this intensity was due to climate change. Much has been said about Charney's report, uh, 1979, uh, where, he, where he estimated the most probable global warming for doubling CO2 to be near three Celsius, plus or minus one and a half degrees. And in the fifth assessment of the IPCC, that's 2013, it's the same number. We haven't departed uh, in 2013 from that number. This report is very significant to me in a totally different way. 1979, I was a postdoc at Goddard Space Flight Center. Um, uh, after my degree, uh, married, I was, on, I was a student on the 14th floor. And I married a student on the 13th floor, Jim Bishop, in chemical oceanography. And what we had at the time, because of my visa, we had what is an, in present day lingo, a two body problem. So I was riding the train between New York and Washington, and Jim was a postdoc at Lamont. And Charney, in his um, work with, with Milt Halem, came and said to me, you have to go home to your husband. And I said, in, in, at Lamont, and at the time at GISS, I said, nobody knew, nobody knows Navia Stokes there, what do I do? And he said that I should not confuse my work with my life, they are separate. And he said, since I'm married to a chemist, I could learn chemistry because he had just finished this report. He didn't know what Bert Folin and Wally Broker was talking about. And so I started learning carbon. And so we went camping with Ed Boyle, and I pestered him and, and other people there. And so I started, changed my direction totally. And I think my friends thought that I had gone cuckoo. So anyway, so since 1980 uh, to the 1979 to now, there's no question that the atmospheric CO2 has increased from nearly 20%. And I'll see if I can do this, that, the, that it's, it's due to fossil fuel. This is a compilation. I did very tedious work of defining countries and mapping country emissions according to, to geographic regions. And so you can see, you know, no, you, we don't bring coals to Newcastle anymore, but where, where the fossil fuel emissions started and now, uh, and where it has spread, and you can see the spread of population. So this is just a, it is just a mapping of country statistics 
that we have are based on population and land use information. So you can see here, um, coming into modern day of CO2 observations. So approximately half the CO2 that is emitted to the atmosphere by combustion of fossil fuels um, remains in the atmosphere. And we know it's from combustion of fossil fuel, not just because of the using carbon-14, but also Ralph Keeling's measurements of oxygen. So there's oxygen decreasing, so you don't have to worry about running out of oxygen. It's in parts per million. But we can see definitely the decrease of oxygen because of combustion. So with the Paris Agreement, um, to achieve two degrees warming, you can see where we, the, the emission in 2015, to achieve two degrees, we need to decrease, not slow down, but decrease the emission of CO2 to the atmosphere. And the pledges is already exceeding what we need. So when I look at the problem of emission, the, what we think we know very well is is estimated and self-reported. There's a spreadsheet that says, please fill in the spreadsheet, okay? And so there's, in the US, the Department of Energy keeps track of the, the fuel part, and EPA keeps track on the cons of the consumption. So to say, to, to look at treaty verification, one has to say, trust, but verify. You know, volunteer, voluntary uh, compliance is not very effective. And so what we need um, is some instrument. <laughs> what we need is some instrument um, to, to say whether uh, the emission, to verify climate treaties. So now I come to Charney's paper, which is not well um, acknowledged. And I think this morning and yesterday, we heard a lot about Lorenz's work on uh, sensitive dependence on initial conditions. And in the early days, I think Eugenia can correct me, that a lot of the initials condi initial conditions were statistical interpolation, or you map it onto spherical harmonics or, or interpolate. And what Charney did, and with Milt Halem, who's in the audience, is to use the model, and so using the physics in the model to, to interpolate and extrapolate to get initial conditions. So here in the paper, it says, at the present state of our study, we can claim no more than to have shown the possibility of a trade-off of temperature for wind when one uses historical observations of temperature at all levels and of time for space when one uses historical observations of temperature and wind, et cetera. So to me, this was very exciting to, to, have, a, to have the dynamical way to, to get at the initial conditions. So Eugenia has taken that very far. So I'm follow, follow, so, so with Eugenia Kane, and I think this was, uh, Eugenia, please correct me, this was when you were boss of Norm Phillips. When you were the boss of Norm Phillips during this era when you did this, okay, when Norm, when Norm had, had retired from MIT and gone to work at, at, at NOAA. And so what, what, what they have produced it's the reanalysis basis using the same model and using the observations to produce a long time series. So what, we, what we're doing now, and this is following Eugenia. Eugenia came and for a visit in Berkeley and we talked and then the next morning she came down to breakfast and said this is what we should be doing. So I always listen to number one. So, so what we're doing is you see since this is uh, 2014, the kind of weather observations that we have from different, from different platforms, uh, ground-based, from satellite, uh, aircraft, et cetera, and from ships. But what is, what is very exciting is that now we have launched a satellite, OCO, the Orbiting Carbon Observatory. Those of you who are chemists, nerds would say OCO. You see the CO2? <laughs> you see the... <laughs> you see the CO2 uh, in there. So what is really special about this is that it's designed to, to observe CO2. So it uses the 1.67 micron and the 2.02 micron channels, very narrow channels. And so you know the sun, so you know the re if you knew the reflectivity of the surface, then you knew how many, how, how many molecules got, got absorbed in the atmosphere. The footprint, every time it takes data, is a noodle of, a, of eight, um, 
of eight pixels. Each pixel is about three square kilo kilometers. The satellite takes three of these noodles per second, and the satellite is going at seven kilometers per second. So in one, in one second, in an area which is seven kilometers by about 10 kilometers, we could have of order 24 uh, samples. And so the hope is that we could see through clouds with that very narrow footprint, et cetera, et cetera. So the, uh, the repeat, because of the orbit, the repeat is every 16 days. So again, we have the issue of weather forecasting of long time ago. How do you interpolate? How do you get a for, how do you get the global distribution from these repeat from these occasional uh, over overpasses? So here is an example of the overpass on a on a uh, on a short period. So what we do is to take the lessons from Charney's the, the original paper on data assimilation. It, it wasn't called data assimilation, <laughs> that paper, uh, from Johania. And so what we're doing is to develop a new carbon weather forecast system where you have an init initial model, and this is the model I'm using, the NCAR model now, where we put in interactive CO2. Um, so then we have the model forecast and an ensemble following what uh, Tim Palmer talked about. And so then we bring in the observations and then we have the optimal estimation uh, to go forward. And so what we're doing is to combine the Im imperfect model with the incomplete observations, and then we use the Kalman filter and then to estimate the meteorological state and the CO2. And then once we have the, the atmosphere, we have the, we have the winds, we, have the, we can do the, the convergence and divergences and infer the fluxes at the bottom. So the experiment that my student is doing, Stephanie Wirth, who I hope will finish, uh, this summer, uh, so suppose, okay, so this is, suppose China's emission was underestimated. The US emissions agree between EPA and the DOE agree to about 3%. Okay, so in China, it's, it's absolutely no way. Uh, they update their, their emission estimates uh, maybe five years later because there's no way to, to have comprehensive uh, survey of the country when it is not large scale, when the, when the emission is not large scale. So can we use the satellite data uh, to tell that, that in this particular experiment, I emphasize this is an experiment, uh, not real life, <laughs> that, that there's under-reporting. So first thing is to look at the weather. So this is the spread, this is the uncertainty in the surface pressure in, the, in that particular two week period. I draw attention to two things. So one is over China and the other is over the Gulf Stream. And then when we look at the CO2, then yes, I'm very happy. The net, because we had reduced the, up the, in the emission, pretending we don't know what, what the emission was, the satellite data told us what extra CO2 we need to match the, to match the, um, the observations. And so the, the and so when we look at it, then there's a problem, right? I did nothing over the Gulf Stream. There's no emission over the Gulf Stream, and the model is telling me that I need emissions over the Gulf Stream. So one can now go to the go back to the to the uncertainty, and this is the, the advantage of the ensemble approach, is that I can go back to the uncertainty, and then I can look at the uncertainty in the, in the what I get, the innovation, the inferred extra CO2 that I need. And so you can see that it is related to the, to the, to the uncertainty in the metrology. So this is the approach. This is a very early stage of, of what we're doing. Um, but the approach tells us that where we, there are regions that it is possible, number one, that it is possible um, to, to show, that, you know, I'm going back to the Charney paper, that at this stage of the study, we can claim no more than to have shown the possibility of simultaneous observation, assimilation of observations of both metrology and atmospheric composition to produce 4D, if you will, reanalysis of CO2 in the atmosphere. And the, the important thing here is that it tells us regions or times where we have, we have the confidence to infer the CO2 fluxes uh, from, from the satellite observations, and it's not doable all the time. 
And I keep coming back to Johania's book, um, the cover of the book, where you have the 500 millibar heights. And I kept saying that where the 500, in the ensemble of 500 millibar heights, where they look like raw spaghetti, then there's nothing happening. Okay, so we know the metrology very well. And so that's where we have confidence in inferring, using the metrology to infer where the, where the CO2 is, where the fluxes are. Um, and where, in the, in the, if, if you look at the 500 millibar heights, where they look like cooked spaghetti, there are instabilities and storms. Okay, so that's where we, that's where we can see that the, 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 there's a greater uncertainty in the interpretation of fluxes at the surface. So I'll end here that the A-train, so this OCO is on what NASA calls the A-train. A stands for, um, uh, no, I forget what A stands for. Uh, it was the, oh, it's the afternoon, sorry. The overpass time is at one, you can see the overpass time in this whole fleet of satellites between 1.15. The equatorial overpass time is, is around uh, one o'clock, 1.30 in the afternoon. You can see all the observations in the atmosphere. And so the outlook here is that the OCO3 um, will be, is slated to be on the International uh, Space Station. That's very exciting to me because it's on a, on a precessing orbit. So we have an observation of the diurnal cycle. And also last December, uh, geocarb in a geostationary orbit was, was approved. So what I'm hoping to do here is to have, um, in, a, in a very not career-wise move, but to do something difficult that Eugenia put me on the path to, to do something to assimilate this, and I've switched to the NCAR model using the NCAR software, the DART, the data simulation software, because it's publicly, it will be, once the thesis is done and the, and the work is published, all that software will be publicly available. So in the same way that the lessons I have taken from, from numerical weather forecast, I hope that when this software becomes available, other countries can take this and they can do their own monitoring of their emissions. So I want to emphasize that this treaty, there's no, there's no penalty, there's no fine if a country um, does not meet its uh, ambitions. However, one hopes that such a tool will encourage countries to, to meet their pledges. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ines. Any questions? Okay, this might be a little too tangential um, to comment on, but there were a few things that you mentioned that just made me think about a study I had heard that after 9-11, someone who was tracking weather data noticed that temperatures went up on the planet and you couldn't really peg it to anything that was happening uh, precipitation wise or anything else or, or amount of sun and they traced it to perhaps the lack of uh, airline flights and therefore a reduction in particulates in the atmosphere which then relates to I don't know that we'll be making much progress yeah. in the near term on mm -hmm. uh, further reductions, but mm -hmm. yeah, do you, how does that fit into everything that you might be thinking about? Somewhere in my computer, I have, uh, I have uh, somebody's, uh, <coughs> I have a picture of the flight of the, of the airspace after 9-11, and you can see one, one plane, uh, the president's plane, accompanied by, I forget how many, fighter jets. Um, and what was interesting in that is not just the, the lack of all the contrails in the, in the atmosphere, but what was very interesting was the growth of clouds afterwards. Okay, so, so it was a marvelous case. So when we, when we study the atmosphere, Everything is linked. There is no such thing that I could look at the carbon cycle without looking at the hydrologic cycle or the energy cycle and everything else. 
So I think one of the lessons from going from the weather, from the fluid dynamics, and now going, I kept saying that, you know, when I was a student, we looked at the left-hand side of the equation. So now we look at the right-hand side of the equation with all the forcing terms, the energy fluxes. And I've moved one more step to say what is causing the changes in the, in the, in the radiative forcing, looking at the CO2 cycle and methane cycle. But you cannot do it alone, OK? Allison's talk about self-aggregation uh, of convection and the dependence of sea surface temperature, and that's totally tied. In the, and I'm going to say that the changes in sea surface temperature is going to change the ocean chemistry and the biology, et cetera, and how that affects the, how that affects the CO2 in the atmosphere. Open question. But the marvelous thing is we're looking at, at this totally linked and integrated system, and it warns of more tempering with it. Thank you, Ines. Um, well, I'd like to thank everybody this morning for their great talks and, and for the audience for their, your, your uh, questions.